Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we talk to the change agents trying to make Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the world a more vibrant and inclusive place. I'm your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. And today, our guest is Dr. John Schumann, who is the president of OU Tulsa, as well as the host of Medical Mondays on Studio Tulsa. We talked to Dr. Schumann about how we need to wear masks if we want a football season, what college may look like this fall, and what a medical radio show looks like in a COVID world. Enjoy. We are very excited to have Dr. John Schumann, the president of OU Telsa and the host of Studio Telsa's Medical Mondays show slash podcast on our podcast today. John, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So the first question we've been asking people during the pandemic is, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that, that is definitely the question. I've been asking that a lot, too. I'm doing OK, honestly. I'm actually here at work. I'm at the OU Tulsa campus where we have a skeleton crew. We're a blended campus. Half of our programs are health sciences. So there are people who are first line responders here. Our clinic has been open. Our Schusterman Clinic has been open throughout the pandemic. And our nurses and our doctors have been doing heroic work. We've set up a triage. So every patient that comes in and for about a month, maybe two months almost, we really had no routine business. Everything quickly switched to telephonic, which was part of a huge national trend. So we were pivoted on a dime and we're doing televisits, telemedicine. It was really quite interesting. But now I'd say most of the 75, 85%, depending on what number I hear on a given day, that business is back in person. We're still screening people at the door, taking temperatures. But for almost two months now, we've also been doing COVID-19 testing, not just screening, in your car. So you can drive, you have to make an appointment. And as you still have to have a reason, unfortunately, you can't just say, I want to get tested because I, I want to know. You have to have been exposed or have symptoms, but you can come through. And for six to eight weeks, that was done by our OU Physicians Clinic. And a couple of weeks ago, it switched to the OU College of Nursing. So the nurses stepped up to allow the clinic staff to go full time back to work. And so we have nursing professors and nursing instructors who are doing the testing now. And it moved from out under a tent in our east parking lot. It's now in our parking garage, which seemed to work better. And people seemed to like it more because it was shaded and more so than the tent. So anyway, that's, that's what's been going on here. I heard that you're getting a, like a head COVID officer. Is that true? Yeah. So the University of Oklahoma did appoint a chief COVID officer, a new position, a CCO is what it's abbreviated as, <laughs> All right. uh, a fellow by the name of Dale Bratzler. He is both a physician and an epidemiologist. He's duly appointed in the College of Public Health and in the College of Medicine. He's based in Oklahoma City, but he was appointed by President Joe Harris. So he, he essentially is covering the Norman, the campus, the flagship, the Oklahoma City Health Science Center, and for us here at OU Tulsa. He's, he, so he's really directing policy on all of those campuses with regard to COVID. And so one of the first things he did was to institute a universal masking requirement for all faculty, staff, and students inside the University of Oklahoma. So if you are, I'm in my office with the door closed, and so it's permissible for me to take off my mask. But if I go out in the hallway or interact with coworkers, I am a masked individual. I'm com confused about one thing. Uh, so they hired somebody who was actually qualified and knows about epidemiology for the position? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that's our so, state motto. Imagine uh, that. Were there not any, I don't know, businessmen available that could have served in the position maybe? Well, <laughs> I will be honest with you. I was not privy to the deliberations that went in to selecting the university's chief COVID officer, but I was very happy with the results. I, I didn't know Dr. Bratzler that well, but I had met him a couple of times. And then just last week, he did a, a lunch and learn, we call him, on Zoom, of course, where he Zoomed into the Tulsa campus and we had uh, maybe 150 people listen to him and at, get to really fire questions at him. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of questions, but he, he handles it really well. And so he does that with all the constituencies. He's doing one this week, I think, with it's called the Faculty Senate in Norman. He's meeting with the executive staff at OU. He, he consults with the president regularly. So, yeah, he. It, but you make a, a good and funny point. 
there wasn't an assistant football coach available or <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, they're busy. Um, they're, you know, they're planning for the season. That's a big deal yeah. at OU. I mean, <laughs> you guys know, I don't have to tell you, but they're, yeah. we are scrambling. And fortunately, one of the things I love about working here in Tulsa is I always say in a weird way with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have no residential life on campus here. We're a commuter campus and we're almost all graduate programs, although we do have a few undergraduate programs, but we don't have we don't have dorms, we don't have residences, we don't have Greek life here, and we don't have athletics. And so when you think about a public health emergency or contagion, that's actually a blessing, maybe not so much in disguise. Yeah. So we're at we're at this weird this whole pandemic has been a, like a oh an up and down wave of different emotions and procedures and chaos. And I feel like we are now back there was a there was a stage, I would say maybe like in early April. That was, it was just very chaotic. No one knew a lot about COVID-19 or not enough to tell us about what we should do. There was there was a shortage of PPE. So like people were told not to wear masks, but not because it doesn't help, but because they should stay home in the first place and hospitals need them. I feel back to that weird chaotic period because we know it's bad, right? A lot of people know what we need to do and yet we're not doing it. So no one knows how long this is going to be or whether there's going to be school. But like Union last night pushed back their start date to like closer to the end of April, like TPS is. And I'm like, at this point, just like delay it indefinitely. Like we do not know what's going to happen a month from now. And so my question to you is, as a medical professional watching this, what has surprised you the most about how let, we'll keep it local about how Telsa has handled this? Let me I'll, I'll start with just the national, like in my lifetime, and I'm almost 52 years old, I have, I've lived through crises before, arguably, I've lived through wars, I was a kid during the Vietnam era, but I don't really remember any of that. But I lived through the Gulf War, I lived through 9-11. And every time those kinds of national crises happen, obviously, during Vietnam, there was a great deal of splitting in our country, we had eventually, it got to the point where I think majority of people were opposed to our involvement in the war. But I've never seen a national crisis of this level where we've had not just, we've had no national response, almost none to speak of. And I think for our national leadership to, to really punt it to the states is really telling and it's really disappointing and frightening, frankly. We just have really no leadership or role modeling. Locally, it becomes complex, right? Because we have a patchwork of communities. And I know Bruce Dart personally, and I know him professionally, I think he's done an outstanding job of being clear and consistent, and he's communicated well, and the Tulsa Health Department has been out front at this the whole way. But you, you run into these problems if Tulsa County or Tulsa the city has a stay-at-home order, shelter in place, people call, those basically mean the same thing. Some people quibble about the terminology. Or what's really very current at the moment is, are we going to have a masking edict one of, the, one of the issues with that is, let's say we do it in Tulsa, Broken Arrow and Owasso, just to pick two, a, a, a South and a North community, they're not necessarily going to go along with that. And so the virus doesn't respect borders. Everybody says that. Everybody knows that. So we have people who probably commute or work, live in one place, work in the other. And if they're moving around and obeying one set of guidelines or recommendations, or in the case of a statute, of an ordinance, an actual law, they may not do they may not be obligated to do so in the other community. So it, it gets very complicated. So that's where you wish that the higher level, whether it be the state or the federal government, would be consistent on this issue. And I think the mayor has seen some of I'm a fan of the mayor, but I've seen his definitely taken a hit to his reputation, at least probably arguably in the progressive community. And and a lot of that had to do with the Trump rally that was scheduled for Tulsa. And he appeared to kowtow to go, he'd been very, I think, very consistent on his recommendations to close things down and to close restaurants and close public gatherings, including things like the farmer's market, which is outdoors, where you, in theory, could at least have spacing, which other cities that had been affected earlier, Seattle and New York come to mind, they had kept their farmer's markets open. So it was a disappointment. We couldn't have ours open. Ours is now open. So that's good. But he'd been at least getting plaudits, I think, across the board, although it, people who wanted to get back to work started to chafe and bristle. But I think whatever credibility he had in the progressive community, in the public health community, seemed to 
go away to a large extent with the Trump rally because he seemed to contradict his own previously stated standards. And that, it was disappointing, definitely. But I think he had to he had to do what whatever he had to do politically. I, I wish he'd been able to speak his conscience, but politics is challenging to say the least. It's been really interesting watching the sort of very progressive social justice focused group critique him relentlessly from about late May on. And we're actually interviewing Greg Robinson later today. So we'll have lots of questions for him about <laughs> what he would have done as mayor. But it's, it's a hard situation to be in when the governor is telling you to do something and the president of the United States is telling you to do something. Whether we like that president or not, listeners to this podcast will know our feelings on our current president. <laughs> they are not positive. So just it's fa been fascinating to me to see how what seems to be a relatively simple gesture of wearing a mask has become so divisive for well, not just locally, but, but nationally, especially when we've seen it be effective in some areas, not just in the U.S., but internationally. What, do you have any thoughts on why it has become so divisive? Well, Jesse said something earlier that was interesting, which I was going to quibble with a little bit, which is I think early on, I think that the science actually told us that mask wearing was of no benefit. And so we really had counter messaging on it. And so we've totally, I would say 180 degrees turned in the other direction. And so now we, the science is unanimous, is unanimous as can be that wearing a mask protects the community. You're doing this as a gesture to other people whom you come into contact with or might come into contact with. You're also really protecting yourself it's very important to do so. I think that was part of the confusion was that initially we had an American skepticism to other nations or seeing other folks wear masks and it seemed culturally foreign to us. And once it became acceptable from a scientific viewpoint, it's just become this, this symbol, unfortunately, of liberty or lack thereof. And so people want their right to not mask up in public because they see it as an impingement on their freedom and appeals to morality, appeals to public health, appeals to common sense. None of them seem to work. In fact, they seem to get people who are, I guess you could say anti-mask to dig in even deeper, dig their heels in and say, I don't want to do this. And, and this is somewhat of an outrage. It's tragic, obviously. I think it's having tragic consequences and tragic in the sense that we're watching this very, the other thing that's so remarkable about the pandemic is just how slow motion everything is. We have this amped up 24 seven news cycle that's always with big, bold headlines and tickers across the bottom of the screen with breaking news. And even though this is very, the, the numbers do change on a daily basis. And for a while there in March and early April, when Jesse, when you pointed out that it seemed like the world was upside down and to some extent it still does. We didn't know what was going on. It did seem like the exponent, the numbers were going up so fast. It was like a, a fast moving tragedy. And now it seems just like it's slow motion and none of us are patient just by nature. We're not a patient culture. And then we have public officials who are like incredible, who are incredibly impatient and who just want this to be done with and over with. And that, I understand that emotion. We all want it to be over with. We all want to go back to normal. And everyone's asking what's the new normal. So I, I wish the mask thing wasn't as controversial as it is. I, I don't, I personally don't see it as controversial either as, you know, personally or, or professionally. I think, and I, I'm glad I work at a university that has just mandated the policy and, and tried to keep it as clear and simple as possible. And there's a lot of communication around it coming from both, from all of our campuses, really. We're amplifying messages we get from Norman and Health Science Center. We're issuing our own messages, but the messaging coming out of the Health Science Center in particular, because it's a healthcare first campus they're doing all kinds of things to boost morale and talk about the importance of mask wearing and role modeling and then doing it out in public as well, making it a real, for lack of a better word, it's a mitzvah. You got to do it. It's just something you got to do. It's the right thing to do. We mentioned earlier that you host Medical Mondays on Studio Telsa every Monday. And the one time I was honored to be on Medical Mondays, we went to where now would be across the street from my rental house and into the studio inside TU. I'm guessing you haven't been able to interview people in person the last few months. So how has Medical Monday changed both in how you record it and also the focus of it? Yeah, the focus has definitely been a lot more on COVID-19. There's no doubt about that, because as the person who's 
somewhat tasked with doing the medical version of Studio Tulsa. That's what people want to hear about and what people want to know. And I remember a very, I remember the day in early March where honestly, I was in my normal mode. I was thinking like, hmm, what are we going to do for the next few shows? And it, I, it was either Rich Fisher, who is both the regular host of Studio Tulsa and has been for more than 25 years. He also happens to be the general manager of KWGS. So he, he wears <laughs> those two hats. Or it may have been the producer, Scott Gregory. And one of them said, do you think you could talk to, to Dr. Dart? And I thought, oh, that's what a good idea. So it's good to have a team. And Dart was so gracious. And he actually came into the studio. That was the last in-studio interview I did. And I think it aired March 6th. And I think we might have taped it the Friday before. So we still, I, I can't even remember. It might have been before the announcement of the first case. That might have been what happened. And I think he, he hinted that he knew there was a press conference that next day. We might have taped on the Thursday before the Friday of the press conference of the first case. I think that's what happened. And so it was our opportunity to say, what is COVID-19 and what do you think is going to happen? And in the meantime, I've interviewed people, I've interviewed doctors in New York and Boston who've been on the front lines, critical care folks, emergency room folks. We have done, I even did one interview about, that was a reprise of a book that had come out last year called Dr. Dogs, about dogs that can sniff cancer and diabetes and things like this, mm -hmm. and it's being used in clinical trials and clinical care. And I think I got like a PR push about it. Hey, maybe these dogs can sniff COVID-19. And so she was very up for an interview, but I don't think that's actually panned out. But that was, uh. I feel silly about that interview because it was sort of all the news you can use. But in addition, we've had, of course, the George Floyd death and all of the reaction around that. And so we've done a couple of programs on the health impacts of health disparities and how people of color often have worse health outcomes and are less represented both in the system as healthcare providers, they're underrepresented, but also they're overrepresented as patients and overrepresented in morbidity and mortality. So there certainly has been a lot of, of things, of, of content. So how it's changed logistically and organizationally is, yeah, no in-person interv interviews. In fact, I was basically closed out of the studio for about a month because TU shut down almost entirely, and then they did furloughs. So the station, if you go to the Kendall Hall on the TU campus is where the radio station lives. And there are these signs taped to the glass doors. They look like those like nuclear fallout mm -hmm. signs. They're like they have hash marks in yellow and black and they say, warning, you are not uh, permitted to enter this facility. So the doors are never open. So I always, if I get to go in, I'm masked. I always have to arrange ahead because I'm not an employee. I don't have a key, somebody to let me in. We have, they have to make sure that they have spacing. So they, it's a very small but fierce station. I think they only have seven or eight actually full-time employees. But at any time, there's only maybe three at, or four at most that are there. And so all of the interviews wind up being what we call phoners. So they're done over the phone or like you guys do, we use some app or Skype or something like that to record. And the funny thing is that we at KWGS, we have relatively speaking, low production value. We don't, we no, we no longer have a functioning, what's called ISDN line. So we have been doing phone line interviews on a landline for years and that's the acceptable standard. But since in the times of COVID where you see even like fancy highfalutin television stations broadcasting from home all the time in people's libraries or dens, we've gone to that standard. We already had that standard. So it had, we haven't seen a huge decrement in our quality. That's basically been what we've been doing. And yeah, so I've been doing them all over the phone, which I, it's hard when you have someone over the phone, you can't read their face or their expression or their body language, mm -hmm. but we're making do with what we got. You'll be interested in this. You'll both be interested. So breaking news, truly breaking news. The government agreed to rescind the stuff about international students. Really? Online. Yeah. I thought what I was getting was an update about a um, injunction, but it's actually the government agreed to rescind it based on wow. the fact that every university in the country was like outraged about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what support they thought they would get from universities, but <laughs> yeah, it was just it just was cruel. Yeah. It was just like, let's punish international students and let's punish mm -hmm. punish universities. It's often in today's world, it's international students who are paying full tuition. So it's yeah. even, it was bad in a, in a number of ways. Yeah. They already had to deal with, in some ways, something similar when a lot of the universities shut down and a lot of those international students were 
living on campus and they were told, you've got to leave and go find somewhere else to live for the next indefinite period of time. Right. That brings me yeah. to one of the questions Jesse wanted to ask. Oh, been, yes. We have been talking about a lot of heavy stuff, but this is another important question. So Jesse, I'll let you ask it. Sure. So as a doctor, I know some people who are in a profession, and if that profession is shown in pop culture a lot, usually have very interesting responses to it. Like, I know a lot of cops don't like watching cop shows. I know doctors don't like, like watching doctor shows. So I wanted to know, as a medical professional, do you enjoy watching medical procedurals? And if so, are you more of a scrubs guy or like a house MD guy? I'm probably dating myself here. I was an ER guy. Mm, okay. ER, I was gonna, ER, ER was going to be the one I mentioned. ER yeah. was on, at least it was on for many years, but during the time I was in medical school, and I'm not embarrassed to say that I actually learned medical factoids from <laughs> the television show ER, nice. including like the names of certain drugs used in certain situations. And I was such a fan. I used to read about the show. I even once contacted Dr. Joe Sachs, who was a writer for the show and the technical consultant who's an ER physician affiliated somehow with UCLA or one of their satellite hospitals. And he was kind enough to write me back. And he basically said, which I said that kind of thing. I'm a medical student. I really, I love the drama. I feel like I learned stuff from the show. He said, that makes me so happy because I really strive to make everything medically accurate. Of course, the time sequence of everything is all sped up for drama sake. But that was one of those things. And then Grey's Anatomy kind of came along. That's been forever. It's funny. My daughter loves that show. She's probably watched every episode. I was into it maybe the first couple seasons, and then it just got so heavy on the melodrama, I couldn't take it anymore. Interestingly, I was never a fan of House, even though I really like Hugh Laurie and some of the other cast members. I, there's something about the medical fascinoma, is what we call it, like the rare diagnosis that eludes, it takes Sherlock Holmes to figure it out. I just, the way that I've practiced, I do primary care, so I'm always like looking, we always say this thing, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. So we spend <laughs> all of this time in our medical training, thinking about these esoteric and very rare diseases. And mostly what happens is you get, you're much more likely to get an uncommon presentation of a common thing than you are to get this very uncommon thing. Nevertheless, you want to know that your doctor or your medical professional can diagnose something that's rare, just like you want your pilot to be able to handle stormy weather, even though 90% of the time, 99% of the time, you wouldn't want to be in stormy weather. So I understand that impulse. There's this Dr. Lisa Sanders. She writes a diagnosis column for the New York Times. I like the column. I really like her. I've interviewed her. She's written a book. She actually featured a case that I was involved in in one of her columns a long time ago. But I honestly, like, I, there's something about that whole, I, and I believe me, I like the idea of helping people who can't find a, a diagnosis that's elusive. And she even got to do a Netflix thing where a lot of the time they couldn't even figure out what the diagnosis was. So imagine how frustrating that was. <laughs> but it's, it's a very long-winded way of saying, I like the ER. I love Scrubs, by the way. My kids love Scrubs. We used to sing along to Scrubs. So yeah, I like Scrubs. Yeah, really, like House was really more of a mystery procedural than it was a medical one because some of these things were just crazy and would never actually happen. And like lupus has to obviously happen on occasion. So <laughs> it can't never be lupus. But that's good to know because like, not that anyone will want to watch a TV show about podcasters, but it, it, it is weird when you are when you do something day in, day out to see the, the dramatized version of it and whether you're able to separate what you do on a daily basis from that entertainment. First of yeah. all, there definitely will be a show about podcasters if they're in the right. And then you have like people like Howard Stern who used to just tape his radio broadcast and then put that on the air and people couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. You know what I mean, so there's always that idea of radio people being on television and podcasting people. The other, I used to love Quincy. That was always an interesting uh, Quincy MD. Our dog is named Oh, not yeah. for that reason, but Quincy M.E., not M.D., medical examiner, and Jack Klugman in his post-Odd Couple role. It was That was a great show, and he would always solve the crime by examining the dead body kind of thing. It was very interesting. Was it uh, Diagnosis yeah. Murder similar to that? I feel like that was the same type of concept. I think it was probably the other networks, whichever it was, probably <laughs> yeah. version of that. Yeah, I, that was not something I really watched, but it sounds like it, yes. <laughs> so... The biggest debate we're in now is whether like kids are going to, going to be going back to school in a month, two months. What do you, has OU already made a decision on that, or are they still waiting to see? OU made a, dis a bold declaration June first. President wow. Harris announced that we were going to come back and be in person in the fall, and I honestly led the way. I don't know if we were the very first in the nation, but he just made it quite clear that we were going to do whatever it took 
to be back on campus. There have been several caveats to that. For one thing, like a lot of schools, we're going to have a lot more distancing. Now, this applies to Norman with the dorms. You're going to have a lot more single rooms and apartments. You're not going to have a uh, big, big multi, multi-person rooms. Right now, the plan is for class sizes of if there's 40 or fewer people in the classroom and you can safely socially distance in the classroom, then the class can be in person. A class size of 40 or more. So you think your big lecture classes yeah. are 50 to 100 to you know, 200, 250. Those are going to be online. The, and uh, for us, I know you told us so we don't actually have, I think, our biggest, our single biggest class might be approach 40. So we're planning to be in person with the ability to pivot to online. And then, of course, individual instructors may have their own health risks or health conditions that preclude them from coming in person. And so there's a whole HR plan in place for people to essentially, whether it's disability accommodation or risk of COVID, they're able to, they're able to teach online. So I think with school, what you're going to see is I've been obviously following the higher ed literature, or the, I guess you could say the higher ed periodicals. The range I see is anywhere from two thirds to three quarters of universities have declared that they're going to be back in session in person. Notable exceptions to that are the Cal State system, which is like 20 campuses in California. They're going to be all online. A, a small college I happen to know because my daughter attends there is Bowdoin College in Maine. It's a very small liberal arts college. That president waited very long in, in mid just recently, not mid-July, but early July, declared that they're only going to welcome first-year students and transfer students on campus in the fall, but only for online classes. So everyone's online at Bowdoin. And then interestingly, Harvard, which is relatively speaking much bigger, but obviously a huge prestigious Ivy League school, Harvard's doing the same thing Bowdoin did. Bowdoin was out, I thought, on a dangerous plank because they were going to charge full tuition in the 20s or 30s of thousands of dollars and only offer online classes. So you, you have to wonder who's going to sign up for that, especially if you can't even be on campus. That's an interesting kind of, I don't know if debate's the right word, but, but looking at things like tuition fees and stuff like that, because in a lot of ways, it's not cheaper for the university to run a bunch of online classes. In some ways it is, but in some ways it's not in... For professors, in some ways, it can be more work to put together some of the online classes. But for the students, in some cases, they may at least perceive that the value is less. So when you have a situation where it's not really a lot cheaper, but the student may not feel they get the same value, how do you balance that? So what OU did, and a lot of universities did in the spring, when most places didn't have their students return after spring break was they gave refunds on the room and board part. They said, mm -hmm. we're, we're not, you're not here. We can't really charge you for room and you're not eating here. We can't charge you for board, but they really did want those. There were no tuition refunds and there was actually a suit brought at OU and most of the, the private colleges, like for example, a lot of the public schools like OU and OSU have announced flat tuition, no raise in prices. And for OU, that's the third year in a row. Interestingly, the private colleges, all colleges are dependent on tuition dollars. They just all are, whether they're public or private. But the private colleges have been fairly adamant that if they're not going to charge for room and board, they still have to charge that full tuition because it's going to be a huge hit to their bottom line. One of the prestigious small liberal arts schools, Williams College, which is in Massachusetts, they have announced a 15% tuition cut, which is fascinating because you would think that would give them a lot of popularity, a lot of goodwill, a lot of good press. And it really is a shot across the bow to the other. Now, Williams is one of those schools that has a large endowment. And so can just in it probably in an, its administrator's own mind can justify doing that for a one year or two years or what have you. It'll be fascinating to see if other schools either follow suit or try to resist that temptation. Bowdoin made it very clear they're not going to do that. And my daughter and her classmates were all of a mind of, we're just not going to pay for this online thing. The beneficiary of a lot of these private schools are the state schools. I've been hearing the projection numbers for Norman. And right now, I think they're expecting a pretty full-sized first-year class. And it, part of that is because they did some survey research. And I think it was more than two-thirds of people either desperately wanted to be on campus or very excited to be on campus. Something like if you would do it on a Likert scale, it was like fours and fives. They're really excited to come back. So the, they were meeting the popular demand. 
obviously, if, if there are a lot of cases of COVID breaking out or people get sick or can't stay in school or don't feel well, or there's a outbreak in the community and Norman or the faculty or staff are afflicted and can't, can't work or can't perform their duties, then it becomes a real problem. So there's just lots and lots of contingency planning. What measures could a public school system put in place to protect both the children and I think most importantly, the teachers? Yeah, I, I just, I, I can't imagine how hard it is to be a school administrator in common education now, because one thing I think you've got to enact is universal masking. For small children, that's got to be so confusing, perilous. You talk about physical distancing. For toddlers or small kids, it's hard for teenagers and college kids, let alone who can intellectually understand it physically and socially don't want to do it. But for young kids, I, I just, I don't know. And, and a, a college campus has the, the benefit of acreage and buildings and can pivot it has, if you're a big public university so you have the stadium or you have an arena you have some really bigger lecture halls and facilities you can use to space people out but a school a high school or a junior high or an elementary school especially an elementary school they're physically constrained so unless they bring in the the trailers the portable classrooms essentially where they could enact more spacing and that's costly because then you're renting containers yeah. you're that's another that's a capital cost I don't know how, I really don't know how they do it, how you, every other seat or, now there's all kinds of information about kids certainly not getting as sick when they're infected or whether or not they're, we tend to think of kids, especially maybe toddlers as real vectors of disease transmission, but that may not be the case with COVID. I've seen some data to suggest they're not the super spreaders that we probably believe that they are or asymptomatic carriers and spreaders. Nevertheless, as you point out, the teachers and the parents, this is a difficult dilemma. I think we all want kids to go back to school for so many reasons, for their own education, primarily for like their own sanity or the, the parental sanity, for the teachers to work, for the economy to be open. There's so many aspects to it. And here we are in July. School starts basically in a few weeks. And yeah. I don't think anyone really even knows yet. There's just lots of proposals on the drawing board. But you pointed out that uh, Union, I think, pushed its start date back. TPS did that. They usually start in middle of August. They're, they're going back to August 31st, and they're stretching the school year out with longer days, more days off in between where they can pivot. Ha planning, I think, every Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, is like going to be an online day. And doing that allows them to clean facilities, to have a pivot point in the week, to go fully online if they need to. I think their scheduling was actually fairly clever. It remains to be seen, obviously, how well it will work in, in reality. I know, I believe it's Virginia maybe, is doing it to where even more extreme where they're splitting the schools in half, where half would go Monday, Tuesday, the other half would go Thursday, Friday with the day in between to clean, and then the other days would be online. It feels like at this point, because there isn't really any national leadership around it, it feels like everyone's just trying out something different and hoping that something will work. You're right. I wish there was some sort of better national policy because you'd think that you could at least regionalize some of the plans. You could do head-to-head -head studies. You could do comparative trials. It Unfortunately, in this scenario of every system, every region, every place for itself, it doesn't lend itself well to a great deal of cooperation. We can use the examples of other countries, but of course it becomes inapplicable if we have rampaging spread of infection. And today's news was the highest case, new number of new cases in Oklahoma that we've ever had, over 900, almost a thousand new cases. Yeah. And that's a lot, far more than the previous high, which was far more than the previous high before that. We're not, <laughs> I mean, we're, I don't, we're not containing this. Actually, more today new cases than New York had, this, the entire state of New York. They had nine, like 912 new cases today, and we had 980-something, 90-something. But at least we're not Florida, which had enough cases that they were above other countries, like certain other countries that, are still, that still have out outbreaks. So at least we've got that going for us. <laughs> we're never the worst. <laughs> We're always just close to being the worst. Uh, imagine that. Another episode of Pod for Sad, isn't it, Chris? Mm. Which I saved as a fun blooper for later. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. yeah. Our, our episodes have not been as bright and sunny as they used to be, but that's the reality we live in now. An important question that I think at least some of our listeners 
and also me would like to know is how realistic is it that football would happen this fall? That's a great question. Take So here's the caveat is I, I do attend executive meetings with OU. The athletic director is part of those meetings. The president is part of those meetings. Those are two individuals who definitely want to see football. In fact, I would venture to say it's unanimous. Everybody wants to see football, maybe with the exception of healthcare people who think not that they don't want to have football, but let, let's be smart. At a recent meeting, I won't name any names, but there was definitely a sense that there was a groundswell. You had a, the first game of the season with OS, that OSU announced they were canceling, or I don't know if they did or their opponent or was mutual mm-hmm. because they were out of conference. You had two of the Power of Five conferences, I believe the Big Ten and the Pac-12, both declare they're not going to play any non-conference games. Somebody on the meeting pointed out, well, actually it wasn't in the meeting. It was somewhere else. Somebody made the comment, that sounds good, but like the Big Ten got from Nebraska to New Jersey. It's not like they're all staying in one little bubble here, like Walt Disney World, the NBA kind of thing. So they're still traveling. They're taking planes or buses or going to different stadiums. Yeah, like you're, in theory, like reducing the risk a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or as of now, the SEC, the Big 12, and the ACC have not made those decisions. But I can tell you, it's July. By now, we would have had full board. I don't know. I don't really understand how football, the, the schedule works, but would they be in full contact practices? They would have clearly had the spring game, which got canceled practice got the start of practice got delayed and then it started and then it got i think shut down again your question is an important one one of the many contingencies that they're looking at is playing the games without fans or playing the games with vastly reduced numbers of fans which is still the financial hit of course a lot of the money comes from television Mm -hmm. but having fans in the stadium buying tickets and showing up and tailgating and selling merchandise that is a huge revenue driver too So they very much want to have football as much for the morale and the spirit part of things, certainly as much as the revenue side of it because of the tradition and and what it means. But I can tell you, OU has been around for 130 years and been through two world wars, a depression. And we had this really interesting insight from David Levy, who's who I guess is emeritus now, but considered the uh, historian emeritus. A professor of mine. You guys yeah. are not. Yeah. You took we both at him. He, he wrote this wonderful email that I could share with you, actually, because it was allowed to, to be shared and made public. But he basically talked about how OU weathered the Depression and World War II and other years of great deficit and hardship. And he basically said, there's never really been anything like this. But the uplifting part of the message was, we've seen bad before and we'll get through this somehow. That was the the note of hope at the end. But it, so I guess my point was commencement got canceled. Why would you, you you cancel commencement? Because it's a huge public gathering of people and you have parents and grandparents there who may be vulnerable and it's a huge disappointment. And just like canceling football seems unimaginable, but it could happen. And Mm -hmm. honestly, this is me, John Schumann, as a person just predicting I'd love to see football too. I I watch football. I like it. I honestly think that if the trends continue as they are, you're going to see games canceled. Whether the whole season's canceled, I don't know, but you're going to see games canceled. That may not be OU. That may be in Florida State and Texas Tech and Texas A&M. I hope it's not OU, but it it could be. Yeah, it'd be great if Texas had to miss an entire (laughs) season, but we didn't. That'd be lovely. (laughs) Yeah. You've started to see like the SEC putting out commercials where all of their head coaches are saying, if you will, basically the messaging being, if you want to, if you want a season, wear a mask. But if you wonder if that could be the thought of actually losing football could be something that could get through to some of the people who are so adamantly opposed to masks. If that might be that one sort of crux issue that could get them past their issues with a mask saying, man, we may lose something that brings us a lot of joy if we don't. Well, sports is probably one of our few great remaining unifiers, right? Mm -hmm. We can all put aside our differences and cheer for the home team or whatever. So I agree. I I plotted those coaches for uh, stepping up and doing the public service announcements. And I know Coach Riley at OU has been, I believe, asked to do it. I I think he's done it on social media. I I don't Mm -hmm. know. Exactly no, but I he's my understanding from the athletic director was he'll do whatever it takes to get people to as you said if you want a football season do what the public health officials recommend mm-hmm. wear a mask 
etc. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's one of those things like if we just started it now, if everyone just put on a mask right now, or I wanted to ask you, but we don't have time because I know we all have to go do other things, but if we all just maybe embraced like the face shields instead of the mask, <laughs> maybe people would be happier because then you could at least make eye contact with person and see like the expression on their face. But that may also probably make learning a little easier. But anyway, so during this crazy time, what have you found yourself doing when you are not working or being asked questions about the pandemic? What is your sort of pop culture comfort food? Are you binging things on Netflix? Are you listening to audiobooks? Are you just like taking walks with a dog? Two walks a day at least with the dog that have been longer, and that has included the kids, which has been really nice. And having the kids home, one from college and one one who's going to be a high school senior, that's been really special. And as my wife pointed out, the one who's in college, they're three years age difference. And so she was out of the house and growing up, and now they've had this time together that they would have otherwise maybe never had. So it's been like one of the few blessings. So dog walks, reading has been a big part. My wife is studying mindfulness and meditation and actually trying to get a degree. So I've been along for the ride and trying to do some of that, which has been helpful with the stress. The other big thing, yeah, binge watching, we had never watched The Americans. And so we mm. rapturously binge watched The Americans, all 65 episodes. And I actually, slightly, only slightly embarrassed to admit it, I'm a fan of the Talking Sopranos podcast. Uh, with Michael <laughs> nice. Carioli and uh, Steve Sharippa. And I've listened to that and that's caused me to want to go back and watch episodes of The Sopranos. It's amazing <clears> what the impact that had on popular culture because that show ended in 2007 and in 2020, they started a podcast about it and I guess <laughs> it's doing pretty well. And it's making people like me go back or people who've never seen it. If you've never seen it, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. But yeah, I'm an avid podcast listener and uh, only recently discovered Pod for Good. I really enjoy it too. You guys, great Woo. work. Thanks. No, thank yes. you. I got to say, these podcasts are good and it's really not Chris and I's doing, but <laughs> I want to thank you for taking time to talk to us. And I hopefully, I imagine the majority of our listeners are mask wearers, but maybe they are related to people who are not mask wearers. And maybe this will help them in some way convince those people to wear masks or just think about how often they need to go outside. Right. Summarize. So, One, do the right thing, wear a mask. Two, if you want football, wear a mask. Three, <laughs> if it makes any difference, public health and medical people say wear a mask. I like that that's third. And oh, uh, four, just don't leave your house if you don't have to. Because that's, yeah. then you don't have to, if you hate masks, just don't leave your house. Then you don't have to worry about wearing a mask. Yeah. We can literally get anything delivered to our homes at this point. You don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> Other than gas for your car, which you wouldn't need if you're not going out anyway. I heard uh, a podcast with Michael Osterholm, who's the guy from the University of Minnesota who's been on TV a lot. He wrote a book about, the, he said, since March, he hadn't like filled up his tank once or something. He said that really that drove home the point. And he hadn't like been in the same physical proximity to his grandchildren. That really moved me because he's a very sort of sciencey technical guy, but he's really smart. I, Center for Infectious Disease Policy, I think it's called the University of Minnesota. That's, that's an excellent uh, resource. Yeah. yeah. I think if the Costco was closer to Chris and I, I wouldn't have had to fill up on gas as often as I've had to over the last couple of months. Yeah. Also, like my family living out in Broken Arrow doesn't help either with the gas, but I have been using less of it and it's been super cheap, which I, is good for me, not good for a lot of oil and gas people <laughs> right. in the state. Yeah. But they've had plenty of good times. <laughs> John, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully this episode, I can edit together where it doesn't sound like we spent 30 minutes trying to reconnect to the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, nice to meet you. Thanks, yeah, guys. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for listening to our conversation with Dr. Schumann. Uh, please check out his Medical Monday show on Studio Telsa when it normally airs on Mondays. We will also link to that podcast in our show notes. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast anywhere podcasts can be found. And again, Telsa, be safe out there. Wash your hands. Get it done. And wear a mask. Mask.